<laughs> My name is Christian Van Tilvoor, and I've been teaching Monday night classes here for several years. I'm on the OCIA team, and I'm in my fourth and final year of the Common Formation Program to become a lay ecclesial minister for the diocese. So it's been a fun road. I'm a convert. I became Catholic just in 2009, and I love teaching these classes. So without further ado, let's get started. Out of curiosity's sake, how many people have started reading the book? Say, read at least the first few chapters. Raise your hand. All right, most of you. How many of you have read most of the book or finished the book? Nobody. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we are just going to do chapters one through four today. And these chapters, if you haven't taken a look at the book, they're tiny. So that's about you know, 10 minutes worth of quick reading. Though I don't recommend you read it that quickly. It's good stuff to read slowly and ponder and let it soak into you. My favorite part of the book is the action steps at the end of each chapter. Those action steps are incredibly practical. Look, place God at the center of the next decision you make. Go to Mass twice this week, Sunday and any other day you like. Seek out a spiritual coach. If, I mean, if you're looking for something to do for Lent, you have no idea what to do. Well, here's suggestions for the next 40 years. <laughs> Seriously, if we followed the action steps in this book, that would be some incredible change. So what we're going to do during this class is we are going to do as many action steps as you can reasonably pack into every class. I believe today we're going to try and get to three of them. And for assigned homework, again, there will be no test. Homework is optional, but homework is a good idea for spiritual growth. Every week I'm going to send you home with a homework assignment, one of these action steps to ponder and work on during the week. Sound like a plan? Yes. yes. All right. Let's start off with God wants us to be happy. God wants us to be happy. What do you think about that statement? True? False? True. 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 Yes. Well, <clears throat> if you uh, concentrate on the Old Testament, it doesn't seem like he's looking for happiness. It's more like <laughs> you obey or else. Oh, it depends on what part of the Old Testament you're reading. <laughs> um, well, so it seems to be more fearful than you know, the seeking of happiness. Well, you know, there really is a progression in Israel's history where they learn more and more about God as they go along. And I'm trying to think, though, because even in the very beginning, God lets it be known, I say to, to Abraham back in Genesis, that I have great plans for you. I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to give you descendants that number like this. I'm going to do great works through you. God also tested Abraham. Abraham knew that God was one and knew that God was to be obeyed, but also knew that God was generous, a giver of good gifts. Even from the very beginning, from the story of creation, we see how God is generous and a giver of good gifts. So this theme of God's goodness and provision and mercy runs through it from the very beginning. I'm gonna go back to Eden. Did God want us to be happy? Yes, he did. That was the original plan. <laughs> I guess the other question to sort out with regards to that, God wants us to be happy, how important is it? Is it important? Is this something we should spend a big part of our Christian life, say six weeks plus, focusing on? Or is this just self-help fluff? I think it depends on where you're trying to seek happiness. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Wow, that's the right answer. Elaborate. I think if we're trying to seek happiness in the things of this world alone, we will fall very short. Yes. Absolutely. That. But if we seek first happiness in God and serving God and um, being the best we can. There's some people that start out by serving people, by doing good for humanity, and from there find their way to God, start seeing Christ mm -hmm. in people. And I think there's some people that start out finding God, and from there, learn the joy in serving people. I'm definitely in that second group. I found God first and learned to love people second. 
But I think God's got a different path there for everyone. They, they tie in eventually. Let's see. Interesting. It, it, uh, my next line touches on just what you said. We can start out with serving people. But when we get it into our heads that the Christian life is just about doing the right thing alone, sucking it up, doing what we know is best, and not about seeking happiness, we are on the way to spiritual burnout. Seeking and finding happiness in God is a vital part of the spiritual journey. For one thing, it's our beginning, it's Eden, it's our end, it's heaven. And it, it's our accompaniment all along the way. We need to find it. We need to look for it like treasure, and we need to find it. God doesn't just want us to be happy. God commands us to be happy. There are hundreds of verses in the Bible saying this over and over again. And I think we get so used to hearing them, we don't even think about them anymore. Here are a few. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Your statutes, O Lord, are my delight. Let the righteous be joyful. Let them exult before God. Let them be jubilant with joy. Those who look to God are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. The cheerful heart has a continual feast. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Let's get to the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed is this, that, and the other thing. Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. Celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. All the way down to blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. God's call for us to be joyful, happy, Blessed runs all the way through scripture. It's a major thread. I think those verses sometimes fly right over our heads, fly right past us. Part of it is the elevated religious language, you know. Rejoice and be glad, blessed are you, holy are you. We don't quite realize that as God saying, be happy. <laughs> It really could be translated, be happy, and sometimes it is in the more modern translations. I'm thinking also of, uh, we've done classes with Bishop Robert Barron where he talks about the Beatitudes and he, translate the, and he translates them as, happy are those. You remember that? Those of you that have been in those classes? Yeah. And finally, consider this. God doesn't just want us to be happy, command us to be happy. He chose to die on the cross so that we could be happy with him in heaven forever. Eternal happiness, the very goal of our existence. So, God wants us to be happy. Never let yourself forget that. It's a central part of the Christian message. Underline it three times. God wants us to be happy. God even seems to think that we're capable of choosing happiness. Some days I'm less sure of that than others, but that's what God seems to think. There's a happiness that isn't dependent on our circumstances, but on our everlasting God who never changes. How else can he tell us, rejoice in the Lord always? So, let's play devil's advocate here. Can we be happy all the time? I see heads moving many different ways. Was Jesus always happy? Was he just having a ball on the cross? Certainly not in Gethsemane. Certainly not in Gethsemane. And certainly not on the cross. But let's look at Jesus on the cross. Back to uh, Bishop Barron for a moment. In his talks, he often points to a crucifix and says, it's a paradox of the deepest order, but this is the picture of a happy man. 
That was the single line I found the most difficult in that last <coughs> class that we did, Priest, Prophet, King. I could not wrap my head around it. And in preparing for this class, I finally started to see the light. <coughs> Jesus on the cross is a man of perfect integrity and perfect love. Jesus has put aside all the less important things of this world so that he can do the will of his Father. He's given up health and comfort, food and clothing, the approval of other people, power and control, everything we tend to cling to. He has set all these aside. He has made himself poor, despised, and powerless for the sake of our eternal happiness. Also, funny enough, for the sake of his eternal happiness. I'm getting there. Jesus also has perfect love. Even on the cross, he forgave the soldiers who were killing him. He promised the criminal next to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. He's still ministering to other people, despite being in this kind of pain. Love makes us happy. Jesus kept on loving. Because of the utter and complete goodness of his heart and life, Jesus is as happy on the cross as a person in his situation could possibly be. Does this make sense? Yes. Define yes. love. Define love. Putting other people ahead of ourselves. See, seeing God in other people. Does that sound right? Anyone want to add to that? Wanting the best for others and working towards it? Absolutely. And that's what he was doing on the cross. Wanting the best for others and working towards it. I like yeah. that. Jesus calls us to develop these habits of holiness. You mentioned our lives change when our habits change. Jesus had these habits of holiness, this love for others, this ability to deny himself and follow God. When we have these habits of happiness, these habits of holiness, we too can be as happy as possible no matter what difficulties we face. We're gonna talk a lot about developing these habits of happiness over the next six weeks. What's another reason we forget that God wants us to be happy. Because maximizing happiness involves sacrifice. On the cross, Jesus chose to put aside immediate happiness, staying up late with his friends, enjoying the Last Supper, for long-term payoff. Our perfect happiness with him in eternal life. And as astonishing as it sounds, Jesus is also increasing his already perfect happiness by saving us. He takes pleasure in our company. He wants us to be with him forever. So, it's true. Somehow, this is the picture of a happy man. Jesus was so happy that he could choose to go through this for the sake of even greater happiness. I tell you these things that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's how Jesus described his mission to us. And what did he tell us? Love God and love neighbor. These things I have told you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. In so many little ways, we're called to practice self-denial in the moment, like Jesus did, to gain happiness in the long run. Going after the pleasure right in front of us, paradoxically, will often decrease our happiness in the long run. How many of you got to the point in the book where Matthew Kelly talks about the marshmallow experiment? In the marshmallow experiment, this was conducted some 30 years ago. Children, young children, had a marshmallow placed in front of them and were told, if you can wait 15 minutes, you, we'll, get, we'll put another marshmallow there and you can have two marshmallows. And some of the children 
couldn't wait. They took the marshmallow and they ate it. Some of the children waited and they got two marshmallows. They tracked those children into adulthood and found that the children who at a young age were able to practice self-denial in small ways like that were much better functioning adults. They registered themselves as more happy, more successful, made better decisions in life all around. So, being able to deny ourselves is an essential ingredient in maximizing our happiness. In our imperfect world, happiness involves delayed gratification. But while we're on that topic, here's another myth. Does this mean the Christian life is always about putting off happiness for another day? Are we just supposed to put off happiness until heaven? We're not supposed to have it here. Does that sound right? No. no. This is the, the first example that came to mind. God gave us the gift of the Sabbath. A gift where we regularly take time to rest, to celebrate, to enjoy Him, to enjoy the fruits of our labor. A time where we stop working and start celebrating. God blesses our rest. There is absolutely a time and a place to just grab the marshmallow. Or if you're Jesus, to go and multiply the wine so that everyone can enjoy the wedding. God loves celebration. God wants us to enjoy life in the moment. I believe we'll get to that next week. There's a verse that's really struck me lately. Ecclesiastes 5, starting with verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and to be fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life which God has given him. For this is his lot. Every man also, to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power, to enjoy them, and to accept his lot, and to find enjoyment in his toil. This is a gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. It's a strange passage, like most of Ecclesiastes. And there's a lot in there. God wants us to accept the life that we have, toil and all, as a gift from him, an opportunity to learn, to grow, to practice love. He wants us to enjoy the gifts he has given us. Enjoy our work. Find a way to enjoy our work. Enjoy our life. Find a way to enjoy our life. And the last verse says that even when our lives seem tedious or pointless from our limited viewpoint, God can keep us occupied with joy in our heart. God can walk with us right through it all. How can we live in such a way to receive the happiness that God wants to give us? <clears throat> Over the next six weeks, we are going to look at how to develop habits of happiness, to live like Jesus lived. We can live in such a way that our happiness will grow and become resilient. It will become harder to shake. We can reject habits that cause us to shrink back down into discouragement, <coughs> despair, sinful habits. Here's just one example that Matthew Kelly gives. A CEO he was advising had Bible written on his day planner. 7 a.m. Matthew Kelly was impressed. In his experience, a fair number of CEOs actually do read the Bible daily, but who writes it on their day planner? And he asked this man, so do you actually read the Bible every day? The CEO said, not absolutely every day, but most days, yes. And Matthew Kelly said, do you notice a difference in the quality of your days on the days when you do read it compared to the days when you don't? And the man said, absolutely. On the days when I do read it, my mind is in order. My heart is in the right place. On the days when I don't, it's like I'm always behind scrambling to catch up. How can we live to receive the happiness that God wants to give us? There's one way. The habit of daily Bible reading is just one habit of happiness. Now, 
we're going to do a little activity. We're going to do an activity after every one of these bullet points today, one of Matthew Kelly's action plans. What are three activities that increase your happiness? For this man, it was daily Bible reading. What are three activities, preferably repeated activities in your life, not one-time shots, that increase your happiness? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about this. Maybe you can pray about it. Write them down.